Welcome everyone to Unseen New England, Re-Envisioning Black Presence in Early American Art. Uh, I just want you to know that, uh, note that this presentation is being recorded and we'll be posting it on our website and YouTube channel. Um, if you don't know us, mm -hmm. our, the group organizing this, uh, the Partnership of Historic Bostons, we are a small public history group focusing on New England in the 17th century, which we regard as the most ex exciting century of recent memory. And uh, we began life as a link between Boston, Lincolnshire and Boston, Massachusetts, but we've broadened far beyond that to tell the story of all people in 17th century New England. Um, and our programs are free, they're open to everyone, and we're very reliant on donations. So this is the third uh, in our series, Recovering Black History. And if you missed the first two presentations, I'll be sending out a link to both of those, including this one next week, or you can look anytime on our website to see uh, past presentations. Um, now I want to introduce Emily Gavalt, who's going to lead us in an exploration of what early American art tells us about the Black presence and absence, probably more importantly, in early American or New England art, I should say. The artworks we're going to see here are part of a really superb exhibition, Unnamed Figures, which Emily curated and which first showed at the American Folk Art Museum in New York, where I saw it, and it is now at Historic Deerfield, so which I encourage you all to visit. ASAP, of course. Um, we um, we uh, normally, as history buffs, we focus on the word. I think uh, the written word and often the printed word. I think this gives us an opportunity to see a different side of history and to look at it anew in different ways. So I'm very excited about this evening's presentation. Um, a few words about Emily. She is the curatorial chair for collections and curator of folk art at the American Folk Art Museum in New York City. Her exhibition at the museum, her exhibitions include the critically acclaimed What That Quilt Knows About Me and Unnamed Figures, as I mentioned, Black Presence and Absence in the Early American North. Emily received her bachelor's from in art history and theater studies from Yale University and her master's from the Winterthur Program in American Material Culture. She has two decades of, of art world experience, including positions at the MFA in Boston and at Christie's in New York, where she was vice president in the estates, appraisals and valuations department. And she is now a doctoral candidate in art history at the University of Delaware. So, um, I'm really grateful to you, Emily, for making the time to speak to us and specifically not about the whole of early American art, but New England art. And uh, over to you. We're delighted to have you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and I'm delighted to be here uh, as a uh, lifelong New Englander myself. I was born in Cambridge and uh, grew up there. Uh, I, I may now be a New Yorker, but my heart is still in New England, and it's really exciting that the exhibition will be um, is on view in uh, in New England. So I hope some of you may have a chance to go and see it. Um, so this evening, I'm going to focus on um, objects in the exhibition, but also some examples from my dissertation, which is very closely aligned with the show. Um, so if there are particular works that you're hoping to see, uh, I'll try to advise you when, when something is not in the show so you won't be terribly disappointed. Um, but I wanted to give you a broader, um, a broader scope of uh, uh, some of my dissertation research uh, as well as a preview of the show. So I'll begin with, uh, to me, shocking quotation that as early as 1825, we have a Connecticut preacher making the statement that slavery never existed here, meaning New England, to any considerable extent. And for years, it has been a thing unknown. Of course, we know that neither of these assertions was true, but the speaker's confidence in what he was saying uh, was supported by a popular understanding that has sadly remained common into the 21st century. And this is in spite of really powerful scholarship, especially historical scholarship 
disproving New England's wishful thinking about its past. Um, and it's kind of often intentional misremembering of its past. Uh, nonetheless, there is uh, uh, a presence of early Black history in the region that is still commonly forgotten. The idea behind my research and behind the exhibition on named figures is really to use the mnemonic power of the image to try to break through um, some of the reasons that this uh, forgetting or misremembering has been so persistent in popular understanding. So this talk draws on my doctoral research as well as the ongoing exhibition, which, as Sarah said, originated at the American Folk Art Museum opening last fall and is now on view at Historic Deerfield through August 4th. Using examples from both projects, I'll share my thoughts on how, even in the context of such gaps in memory and the collective archive, historical images can further advance our understanding of Black experiences in early New England. Contrary to what many earlier uh, 19th century and early 20th century in particular, what some of these revisionist histories might imply in their diminishment of slavery in the New England region, a rare group of surviving portraits Overmantle paintings, textiles, and other objects documents the presence of Black New Englanders in the 17th and 18th centuries, as well as the early 19th. In comparison to established art historical tropes of Anglo-European imperial centers like London and elsewhere, this encapsulated history of Black representation in early New England is one of outliers. There are so few works from the 17th and 18th centuries that do incorporate Black figures, but it's notable that they do so with a very, um, uh, with a kind of peculiarity that speaks to the distinctiveness of their colonial origins and to the contradictory expectations of household-centered slavery within the region. And we'll talk a little bit more as I go through my examples of what exactly makes these images uh, so peculiar. Whereas imperial centers relied on long-standing tropes that rendered the Black figure as a highly codified and uh, contained symbol, New England, as we will see, produced much stranger compositions in which patrons' very personal but conflicted relationships to enslaved people resulted in new levels of simultaneous intimacy and distance, which displayed deep and complicated entanglements between Black and white experiences. To illustrate these arguments, I'm going to focus in particular this evening on a series of depictions of early African Americans in, um, in New England portraiture, including a late 17th century portrayal um, made in London, but for a Boston merchant, a family portrait from 1740s Matunic, Rhode Island, a suite of overmantle landscape paintings from revolutionary Connecticut and Western Mass, and a tribute to a formerly enslaved man in the form of a doll. I hope that we uh, that I will um, convince you that an examination of the idiosyncrasies of these images illuminates white artists and patrons' conflicted relationships to slavery and Black presence, while simultaneously, for us in the present day, opening a window onto the lived experience of Black New Englanders that we're not able to access in quite the same way without the power of the image. Through the inclusion of little known Black stories in relationship to these objects, my project brings the supposed periphery into the center, questioning the assumption that the primary motivation behind a work is the most important basis for its investigation and aiming to restore in some small measure the realities of New England's multicultural history. So I'm going to begin with um, some background on an early influential model for Black representation, which comes from Europe. We're seeing here um, an iteration of the European Art Historical Convention, often known as the Black Page. And this is one of the earliest known examples of that in this portrait by Titian, um, which features, as you can see, um, a, a young Black child attending to the primary white sitter. Um, so we see him gazing up at her with a kind of fawning expression, which serves to emphasize the authority of the sitter in contrast to the enslaved figure's servile role. And we see this very similar composition being reiterated throughout 
um, 17th century Europe in the Anglo-Dutch tradition in particular. Here we're seeing a child who is also being compared visually with a shell full of pearls and uh, also holding a, a piece of coral. She's being compared to uh, uh, exotic luxury goods, which would have been coming into Europe at this time from the West Indies um, and other, other areas apart from Europe. So we're seeing very clearly an objectification of this child and um, a comparison between her and um, and luxury goods. So these kinds of compositions are less common across the Atlantic in the British American colonies, but we do see examples of, of this insidious uh, trend by the turn of the 18th century. This is an example that was in the exhibition in New York City. It won't um, uh, be on view at Deerfield, um, but this is a well-known uh, example of how um, Maryland and Virginia um, colonists in particular did take up this trope in a way that very closely mirrored what we're seeing in um, European precedent. So uh, scholars agree that these images are really uh, intended to connect relatively isolated Anglo-American colonists to the supposedly sophisticated fashions of cosmopolitan centers abroad. Um, and we see these coming up more in Maryland and Virginia, I think, uh, because of the aristocratic uh, connections in particular of these two colonies where there is um, a very close emulation of what is happening in Europe. Um, New England is a little bit weird and a little bit different, um, as we we know this is true for many reasons, but um, to just to give you a sense for that with this example, which is the earliest known depiction of a Black person made for a New Englander, and as you can see right off the bat, it is very different, um, also extremely rare. Uh, in fact, there are only two examples that we know of in the pre-revolutionary era from New England that demonstrate any kind of connection to this uh, representation of the of what we call the Black page. So these are the two examples, and I'm going to speak about both of them. Um, but first, to um, dig into this particular image, which is um, commonly referred to by the name of the white sitter who was an enslaver, Samuel Shrimpton, who was a wealthy Boston merchant and landholder. So this portrait undoubtedly shared many of the same goals behind the European um, pictorial conventions of the Black Page that we were just looking at, but it takes this very strange compositional approach, which is really out of nowhere. There's really no precedent for this kind of representation um, that I've been able to find elsewhere. It's um, uh, so strange that I, I really think um, it was very likely at the instigation of the sitter himself uh, that this figure was added to this um, to this depiction, which is otherwise a very ordinary um, Baroque portrait of um, of a wealthy man. Um, but you know, you do have to look twice. That's why I have circled this, or you might miss what is happening here, which really makes this picture so unusual and important. Um, we have in the shadows a just visible black figure who um, appears to be a young boy, perhaps in anywhere in the range from 10 to 15 years old, um, perhaps a little younger or a little older. Uh, remarkably, we're seeing him stationed behind a stack of account books. Um, that's what we're seeing here. These are uh, very clearly account books, which would have been um, tools of the trade for a merchant like Shrimpton. We're also seeing writing materials, um, a pen in a, an inkwell, perhaps another scroll of paper that's wrapped up and, and leaning against the corner of the desk here. Um, so a couple of different things to point out. First of all, there's such a contrast in the position of these two figures. We have this intense frontality of Samuel Shrimpton's central portrayal. He, he is seemingly coming into contact with the trompe l'oeil component of the picture. He's as far forward in the picture plane as he can be, whereas the black figure is just about as far back as he can be, making him look all the more remote and diminutive, diminutive and he's really dwarfed by the presence of the picture's primary subject. So this is very much in alignment with 
the constructed social hierarchies of the time, even as this deviates from the uh, conventions that we're seeing in, in those other portraits that I just shared with you from abroad. Um, in fact, Shrimpton's portrait was almost certainly painted abroad. The merchant and his father were both born in Boston, so he's a second generation um, New Englander, uh, but he had numerous connections in London, and he might very easily have drawn upon his connections there to have his picture painted in um, uh, by a London artist. His father-in-law provides the key to this. There's a letter in the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society where this picture um, resides in which uh, the older man writes to his son-in-law in 1675, I have sent you in a case yours and your wife's pictures. So very likely his portrait and his wife's portrait being sent across the Atlantic. And for that reason, we're able to date the picture pretty confidently to 1675. Um, again, the idiosyncratic composition here is really suggests the uniqueness of the circumstances. Um, although the picture was painted abroad, it was painted for a Bostonian intended to be seen in a Boston environment. And um, it results in kind of an, um, um, a combination of the cosmopolitan with Shrimpton's embrace of the Black figure as a symbol, according to European art world tradition, but he's also bringing in a sense of the provincial here because he's deviating from the typical use of the Black figure. We also get a sense for Shrimpton's confidence in making this decision that is so idiosyncratic. He doesn't really care what the convention is, right? He's saying, this is how I want myself to be represented. Um, so we know that Shrimpton was incredibly wealthy. Um, he was a major landowner. He owned the, the land beneath what would later um, be uh, the place of the John Hancock mansion. Uh, across from Boston Common, as well as um, uh, parts of Noddles Island and Deer Isle. Uh, he was incredibly wealthy. And I think that just like these other images we've seen, the, the unnamed Black figure was calculated to add to this impression. We see the youth is neatly dressed, indicating Shrimpton's pride in the maintenance of a person that he would have considered to be his property. Uh, like his enslaver, the boy is wearing a cravat at his neck, and he's gazing calmly and attentively in Shrimpton's direction. He's ready to serve. Um, this is all comportment that would have conferred respect on the central subject. Um, likely counter to Shrimpton's intention, though, I think that the unfamiliarity of the picture's composition actually suggests a sense of realness, uh, which detracts from the typically emblematic function of an enslaved servant in these pictures. Um, because Shrimpton's portrait doesn't adhere to the compositional norms of the tradition of the Black page, um, we, we really um, uh, can get a sense that this was probably based on a real person. Shrimpton had this idea almost certainly based on the presence of a, um, a member of his entourage. Um, I think that the youth's placement uh, tucked into this corner may even suggest that the small figure was added as an afterthought. So a kind of an impulsive instruction on Shrimpton's part, um, which would explain the departure from the artist's ordinary compositional plan. So this possible context strengthens the idea that the black youth was intended as a reference to a real person rather than a stock figure. Um, so someone who was close at hand to, who, uh, whose presence prompted Shrimpton to make this inclusion at the last minute. Um, now this idea of the youth's inclusion as an impulsive um, uh, idiosyncratic request aligns pretty well with what we know of Shrimpton's personality. Shrimpton was not a popular guy in Boston. Uh, he was roundly criticized um, when uh, he disputed a claim against him at court in, quote, a proud and contemptuous manner, which was a move that shocked and appalled many of his contemporaries among Boston's leadership. He also is recorded by no less a source than Samuel Sewell, who notes with um, great disapproval as he and some companions return home after dark in a drunken and disorderly manner, um, quote, such high-handed wickedness 
has never been heard of before in Boston. So scholars have um, pointed to this as uh, an indication that as um, Shrimpton, although he had been born in Boston, was nonetheless considered an interloper. He had amassed this great fortune, but he was sort of looked down on as um, perhaps nouveau riche, um, to use um, a, a more contemporary analogy, whose interest in presenting his material wealth alienated him from a more conservative leadership culture. Um, so this applies to his slaveholding as well, and in fact, to his visible presentation of his slaveholding, which again is so unusual that this is the only example that we have from colonial Boston. Um, Shrimpton enslaved a very large number of people in his household, um, including men, women, and children. Um, we know that slave ownership was treated informally as a fact of everyday life, um, listed haphazardly among other assets. In his widow's um, will is a notation of 14 Negroes, quote, um, valued at a total of 350 pounds. We find throughout the family papers, again, at the Massachusetts Historical Society, brief but regular references to both Black and Indigenous lives. Uh, the Shrimptons are, are purchasing clothes and shoes for Black people living in their household. They're also recorded acquiring and transporting Native American captives um, during the years of King Philip's War. So throughout the course of uh, his life and that of his family, Shrimpton's household is regularly and persistently a place of his enslavement, and his entourage likely included a number of Black people who could have served to take a place in the merchant's portrait, and uh, as he likely intended to burnish his image as a man of wealth and power. But I think that although Shrimpton and his contemporaries would have seen himself as the clear focus of the portrait, the youth's presence for me upstages the merchant. Um, the figure's inclusion may have been intended to advance his elevated sense of self, uh, but the depiction really communicates more than he envisioned. Um, the specificity of this figure with the account books, uh, was this perhaps a young boy, a young man that Shrimpton was training to serve as a clerk? And this was not, inconceivable in New England. In fact, we have in the collections of the Newport Historical Society preserved an account book that was kept by a man named Caesar Linden, who was enslaved to a prominent Rhode Islander in the 18th century. Um, unlike the 19th century South, where um, literacy was forbidden to uh, enslaved people, um, uh, uh, um, uh, a law that really came into effect after some violent uprisings. Uh, we do see literacy being used um, selectively it if it was of use to an enslaver in 18th century New England and indeed 17th century New England. Um, so I think the, the visual representation, this enforced proximity and uh, at the same time distance between master and enslaved that we're seeing in this picture really speak to the realities of the day-to-day -day life for an enslaved person in the Shrimpton household. Um, and this relationship of enforced familiarity was, was typical of New England's system of enslavement um, lived out in very close quarters within the household. So unlike a plantation system in the South where there were large numbers of Black people, uh, but living at a remove from the enslaver in different residences throughout the property. S scholars have sometimes referred to this dynamic as family slavery, uh, which is a term that has some challenges to it, but there was, of course, no sense of comfort or security associated with this situation. And I think we can see, uh, although surely unintentionally, the way that this child has been cast into the shadows of the picture and is really occupying a kind of marginal space that was typical of New England enslavement, suspended between these impossible demands of a simultaneous personal agency, um, someone who is writing, someone who is doing, uh, but also objectification. Um, this kind of extreme distance between such expectations is, is made visible by these vast differences of scale. 
And I think this visualization of conflict brings a new immediacy to our understanding of the challenges for enslaved individuals in the region. So we really see uh, played out visually how wedged in between the space um, uh, between Shrimpton and the picture's frame, and again rendered almost as an afterthought, the boy is haunting this kind of murky territory, this perpetual state of um, liminality to which he, he and his fellow Black New Englanders were, releva were relegated. Now, we cannot name this liminal figure, but we can try, and we should try, like the enslaved woman that the historian Wendy Warren writes about in one of her articles, this person's life, quote, deserves to be reconstructed simply because too many factors have conspired to make that reconstruction nearly impossible, end quote. And this is one of the key threads of the Unnamed Figures exhibition and of my dissertation largely, that the gesture of asking questions, even though we cannot have certainty, is a really important part of looking at early Black history and early Indigenous history, any marginalized history, um, because if we are giving up before we even begin, um, then we really are going to get no, nowhere. And there's actually a surprising amount of information that we can find when we start pulling at threads. So in the case of this uh, youth in the Shrimpton household, although we can't be certain who he is, we can hypothesize uh, he may have been a man named Dick, um, as Wendy Warren herself has proposed, whose name appears more than once in family papers, um, and indeed who is documented in Boston court records as being with Shrimpton as a close member of his entourage um, on a night when the party is attacked by a drunken rogue um, and unfortunately, Dick himself sustains injury, um, which suggests to me just how closely he was um, guarding Samuel Shrimpton in his relationship to uh, his enslaver. It could also be that this represents a man named Robin, uh, for whom a coat was made by Shrimpton's tailor at the end of the 1600s, where he may have been one of the other 14 unnamed Black people documented as human property in the 1713 will of Shrimpton's widow, Elizabeth. So although we can't answer these questions definitively, asking them and asking them in connection with this representation, I think brings us into a powerful contemplative interaction with the histories of Black Boston and where the sheer volume of the documentary archive can threaten to bury Black uh, references to Black lives. This is a pictorial marker of African American history that really breaks through the density of that recorded word, um, as Sarah was referencing in her introduction. Um, so we see this particular life, although we, we can't attach it to a name, we see this life emerging visibly at the surface. So moving from Boston to Rhode Island, I'm going to turn now to the second example of Black representation in white portraiture known to survive from colonial in New England. This is a picture known as the Potter Overmantle. And again, we can see it sets up a familiar series of pictorial oppositions to highlight the distinctions between enslaver and enslaved. In this case, I think the fact that this artist is clearly uh, not um, not formally trained, right? This was very likely an artisanal painter based in Rhode Island. Um, he doesn't, um, he's not entirely realizing his ambition, but we can have a sense for what he's aiming at here with the very upright porcelain complexioned white figures, which I believe are intended to represent the height of sophistication and uh, refined comportment in contrast to a black youth who is notably um, much darker in complexion, but also actually much more fluid in his movement and certainly in his facial expression. Um, he looks ironically, uh, although I think that this uh, depiction would have been intended to suggest that he was less refined. He has an open mouth. He's smiling. That would have been considered very uncouth at this time, certainly in a formal portrait. But in spite of that, he actually, to our eye, comes across as looking more human uh, than the white figures. We can also see 
um, how the um, the uh, we we have an echo here of the power dynamic displayed in many of the other images that we've looked at already, in the way that this the child's position is debased. Right, he's placed on the same plane as these objects. Again, objects of luxury and of global trade, as we were seeing with the young child holding the shell full of pearls. Here, he's placed pictorially on the same level as things like Chinese export porcelain, and at the center of the composition, a silver teapot. Silver would have been mined by enslaved laborers, perhaps, and a mahogany tea table. Mahogany also would have been mined by enslaved laborers in the West Indies. So by placing the child on the same level as these objects, he's, he is being objectified. Um, but we are also seeing just for reference, um, a strong connection to um, Anglo-European precedent, but also uh, really the ambition of this picture um, in seeking to portray such a complex group, um, which has a lot in common with this example depicting Elihu Yale and his contemporaries, um, also with a Black child um, featured in the right-hand margin of the picture. Uh, it would have been very unusual at this time um, to have a picture of this level of ambition. A uh, family group of this scale was an exceedingly unusual undertaking in the colonies at this early date. We're in like 1740, probably. I know it says 1740 to 1760 on there. Don't ignore that. That was, I should have updated that. Um, it was almost certainly um, in the 1740s. Um, and yet this image would have been, um, in spite of the fact that it is uh, not quite realizing the extent of its ambition, um, it, it would for the Potter family have been a way for them to really showcase uh, their refined identity and their wealth. Now, one of the reasons that this picture, uh, that it makes sense to me that this picture um, shows up in Rhode Island is the uh, distinctive circumstances that um, uh, around slavery in Rhode Island, and in particular, this region of Rhode Island, Matunic, which was part of what was referred to as the Narragansett country. So we're just inland of Newport, which of course played a key role in the slave trade, but we have a very large population, especially relative to other areas of New England, of, of Black residents in Matunic. Um, the area is as much as um, over 25% Black at this time in the 18th century. And that's in comparison to um, other uh, rural areas where we're talking about three or two or less than 2% um, people of African descent or African Americans. Um, places like Boston, we reach at certain points in the 18th century as high as a 10% Black population. But Rhode Island and Matunic really stand out in particular as areas where there's a higher Black population than anywhere else in New England. And there is something approximating a plantation culture as well. The reason that this happens is land in this area is especially arable. Um, so uh, white planters are able to, uh, to make a go of something that's a little bit closer uh, in character to Southern plantations, although we're still talking about a much smaller scale operation. Um, and we're talking primarily about farms that are supporting the, um, the breeding of, of livestock and um, also horses. If you've ever heard of Narragansett Pacers, um, this is, is the time period when this becomes um, a popular and um, <clears throat> uh, wealth producing endeavor. So um, the Potter overmantle uh, was also, um, you know, it was aligned with the slaveholding practices of the community more broadly um, and of the Potter family in particular. We know the Potters were among the highest um, or the largest slaveholders in this particular area. Uh, unfortunately, because John Potter's will is, is, is not located, we don't know exactly how many people he enslaved, and we don't have any names, um, but local history suggests that he owned um, more than a score, uh, and we know that he and his um, ancestors, including um, the uh, 
the family that he married into, the Hazards, who were connected to the Robinsons, all three of those families were prolific slaveholders. Um, the Potters also, uh, like Samuel Shrimpton, treated slavery as a part of their daily lives. Um, we have uh, the we have evidence that the Potter House built slavery into its very architecture. So at the moment that this picture was being painted, the Potter Mansion was being constructed. Um, John Potter brings together a group of artisans to construct his mansion house. And we have quite a bit of information about this. He also constructs a, a wing that is dedicated to enslaved residences. Uh, now, adding a really interesting additional layer of complexity to this story is the fact that as he was doing all this, John Potter was also perpetrating a crime. He was a counterfeiter. And these artisans that he brought together to work on his house uh, were also involved in many cases in this counterfeiting scheme. So the construction of his house and the execution of this painting, which itself as an overmantel painting would, would have been architectural in design, would have sat over the chimney of the primary um, hearth in the parlor. Uh, this is all freighted with this history of deception and art and artifice are deeply entangled in the history of this picture and the history of the construction of the house. So we see how the acquisition of and the display of wealth were taking place simultaneously with these urges of greed and arrogance taking multiple visual and material forms uh, from um, mahogany, as we've seen, from oil paint to paper currency that Potter and his cronies were attempting to counterfeit. So I think that um, Potter's dubious morals actually may partly explain, in addition to the, the fact that he was living in an area of high slaveholding, um, his, his uh, um, lack of scruples may also explain why he didn't hesitate to represent himself in connection with slaveholding. Again, this is a very rare practice as we're seeing. We have only two examples of men who make this decision to actually say, I want to be, not only do I want to be a slaveholder, I want to be seen as a slaveholder. Um, in New England, which was often more conservative in terms of displaying conspicuous consumption. I think the fact that both Shrimpton and Potter were known for their arrogance and their eschewal of community norms um, really, um, to me, is an important key to both of these pictures and to the reason that both of these men chose to directly associate themselves with a practice that most New Englanders really were not proclaiming visually in the same way. So we see that these are each distinctive compositions, but they're both grounded in this self-interested agenda of an aggrieved white man. Um, so the ambitious Shrimpton and Potter both being looked at askance for their ambition and, inquisit and acquisitiveness by their more conservative peers. Potter was a Quaker, if I didn't mention that, so he wasn't even supposed to be slaveholding. Um, but white male grievance is really lying at the root of these pictures and I think makes palpable in important ways the fundamentally egocentric nature of this drive to possess another human. Um, so I know I've taken quite a bit of time talking about um, talking about these. I want to speak um, now, looking beyond portraiture, about landscape, which is another understudied genre for Black representation in New England uh, in the 18th century. In particular, uh, I have done quite a bit of work on Winthrop Chandler um, as a case study. Um, Chandler was a Connecticut-born um, painter who is best known for his portraiture, but he also created a number of overmantel paintings like the one we're seeing here. Uh, he worked not only in rural Connecticut, but also in rural Massachusetts, as is the case with this particular example. Um, it's very interesting to look at these spaces that have historically been overlooked as sites of Black habitation, such as rural Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, in the case of Chandler, um, I think it's often assumed that these are pictures that speak to um, again, a refined Anglo-American identity set within the burgeoning uh, 
colonial settler environment. Um, but it's important to note that even someone like Chandler grew up in a slaveholding household, and he would have encountered numerous Black individuals during the course of his life. His father was a slaveholder, uh, his uncles were slaveholders, his brothers were slaveholders. There's no documentation that he himself was a slaveholder, but I think it's very likely because he, um, in fact, did not live very long and was not very successful monetarily. Um, but his son goes on to be a slaveholder. Um, so the fact that there are so few Black figures represented in New England landscape, I would argue, is not because Black people weren't there. It's because painters like Chandler are choosing very selectively when to represent and not represent. So this is one particular example that does show um, an instance of Black presence. We can see where this uh, black um, writer is uh, depicted in the larger composition. And here's a close up of him here. Um, what is perhaps not so easily legible to us today, but what I think is key for understanding this picture, this seems to me to be a playful cross section of colonial society. I think that's what Chandler was um, expecting his viewers to see. We have um, uh, what looks like some, you know, prominent local men riding their, um, their robust steeds, but we also have some comic relief. We have a, a kissing couple here, which would have been, um, you know, also uh, considered a little bit risque. We have, this is hard to see, but this woman is blowing her nose, which would have been very uncouth. This little child here has an oversized bonnet covering up her face. It's too big for her. And so I think it's within this context that we can see the Black rider, um, especially looking at the horse that he's riding, right? Totally different from these robust horses that the white men are riding. He's riding a workhorse, and it's an old, broken down workhorse at that. He's also dressed in very plain clothes. Um, I think we can, even though Chandler's intention may have been to mock him and to place him in a larger context of visual satire of Black figures at this time in the Atlantic world, uh, Black figures were often positioned as figures of humor, um, hapless figures uh, uh, associated with poverty. In spite of Chandler's intention, I think that we can subvert uh, his script, in a sense, and actually ask ourselves what would have what would have uh, been the experience of a Black New Englander in these circumstances. And looking at the picture that way, I think we can really grasp something of um, what a Black man may have gone through uh, as a member of a very small and isolated Black population who would have often found himself in a position of hyper visibility. Um, as we're seeing here in this largely white New England landscape. So interestingly, um, Chandler actually depicts one more person of color in his oeuvre, but much more commonly, he leaves Black figures out of the picture entirely. And we're seeing an instance of that here um, in his um, pretty epic uh, historical um, overmantel painting, which you can see, actually, I think it's a fireboard, um, which would have been used to actually cover up the chimney and block out drafts during the winter. Uh, this fireboard is in the collections of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Um, you may recognize some elements of the Battle of Bunker Hill here, although it's kind of a fantastical pastiche of different components to, um, to make Charleston look more protected than in fact it is. But what's fascinating about this is there's so many figures in this picture and Chandler, who clearly shows us that he's aware of Black New Englanders, nonetheless excludes them entirely from his representation. And we know there were numerous Black soldiers at the Battle of Bunker Hill. So we can speculate that he only included Black figures uh, according to his sense of the place of Black people. Um, so to tell a joke, uh, that made sense to him, but to represent um, a moment of heroism, um, there was no place in his mind for a Black figure within this context. So this um, vision of absence is, um, or um, servility or, or humor is 
pretty typical for what we see in other forms of landscape. I'll just share uh, the example here that was in the introductory slide, a needlework picture um, made by a young girl in Newburyport, Massachusetts at the turn of the 18th century. So we can see several black figures. Um, I think I have a detail here. Um, in, and this man is very clearly being shown in a servile capacity. He's also been given some sort of exotic headgear. Um, we have examples of black figures up top here who are positioned along with palm trees. So we're seeing the way in which um, even young girls are being taught through the process of making needlework according to certain patterns that would have been laid out for them by their school teachers. They're being taught how to absorb these same stereotypical ideas that an artist like Chandler had absorbed and presented in his landscape paintings. Um, we see uh, too a very similar example in this depiction that you might recognize as Boston Common. We have the John Hancock house in the background. Um, and the Beacon of Beacon Hill here. This was also in the collections of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Uh, scholars have speculated that the figures in this picture are portraits of uh, John Hancock on the horse and his uncle, Thomas Hancock, and his wife um, standing by the wall overlooking the stream. So then we have to ask, is this Black figure also a portrait or a representation of someone in the Hancock household? And we certainly know that the Hancocks were slaveholders, and there are numerous Black people mentioned in the documentation around the Hancock family, including a young man named Cato, for whom John Hancock is documented bringing back several gifts after a gift, after a trip abroad. But to finish up my consideration of landscape, I want to bring up um, a picture that might at first seem like a strange one to include because there are no figures at all here. Um, but uh, we wanted to make the point in the exhibition that even landscapes that are entirely absent of people can offer opportunities to tell more complex Black stories, as in this example by the Connecticut-born um, artist named Ralph Earl. Uh, the quiet paths of this unpopulated Connecticut landscape actually belie the historical presence of a number of Black residents, uh, although typically this picture is interpreted in terms of the story of the wealthy uh, white Boardman family who lived in this house and who operated this general store. Um, much uh, There are numerous unrepresented Black residents who helped give shape to New Milford in very meaningful ways. Uh, New Milford is the town that's pictured here. Um, in uh, Northwestern Connecticut. In particular, because we have the surviving account books of the Boardman family, we know that uh, the Phillips brothers, including men named Jerule, Samuel, and Reuben, as well as their brother-in-law, Philip, uh, the Phillips brothers frequented this store buying staples and small luxuries, uh, but also exchanging goods for their service um, their service at agricultural labor. They did quite a bit of farm labor for the Boardmans uh, and offered all kinds of agricultural services, not only for the Boardmans, it seems, but also for the town of New Milford. So we can picture this landscape as an entirely different um, storytelling device than perhaps has typically been presented to us in the interpretation of an image intended originally for the Boardman family. The Boardmans may have owned the land, but black laborers like the Phillips brothers worked it and they created this picturesque idealized order visible in the bucolic landscape. I'm realizing I'm going way over time. So I'm, I'm gonna check in in a minute and see what questions we have. Um, but I wanna just share um, some really beautiful words from a descendant of the Phillips family um, to hear their reaction to this picture. We were thrilled to be able to contact uh, um, two descendants of the Phillips family, Joan Huggins Banbury, and uh, here on the screen with her words, Bonnie Johnson, who uh, shared with me that when she first saw the picture, it didn't seem very inclusive. But as she says, I thought about it and looked at it more, and it also gives me a sense of place. I'm from there. I grew up there. 
my ancestors have been there as long as white New Englanders have. So this particular picture, um, which I'm afraid was not able to travel to Deerfield, but nonetheless, I think we can take this as a really important example of how we don't have to follow only the script set forth for us by an original maker or an original patron of a work of art. There are other stories that we can tell when we're looking at and meditating on these works of art, um, and they're often surprising ones that I think can serve in a really valuable mnemonic capacity for remembering the lives of um, those who have not been recorded so robustly in the documentary and narrative archive. So it's 650. I'm going to pause there briefly to see if we have any questions. And then if I have more time, I can talk about some more objects. Does that sound good, Sarah? Okay, great. Let's take a look at what, oh, there's lots of stuff in the chat. How exciting. Okay. Yes, we have even, oh, looking back at the Shrimpton picture, even the proportions of the accounting books to the youth are outsized. That's true. Oh, so there's a question. Yes, any chance the black figure was added later to the Shrimpton portrait? There is no evidence of that. We did just have the picture um, cleaned um, by a conservator for the purposes of the exhibition, which is actually very exciting to be able to literally illuminate black histories with the cleaning of that picture. Um, there's no technical evidence that that would have been the case. And it would have been a very strange, um, very strange addition. Um, actually, we do have a lot of examples of black figures being erased from portraits. Um, and there was a very famous one um, in a picture that was a 19th century portrait from the South that was recently acquired by the Met. Um, if you want to read about that, it's called Belazare and the Fry Children. It's in it. They've now restored the image of the black figure. Um, let's see. We're so we're having uh, the. Um, uh, I think this is about Matunik. The location was twenty five percent African indigenous. Um, the the. Um, that I'll, I'll, I'll be looking that up because the data that I have has a total of 333 African people of African descent in Matunic, 200 indigenous people, and about 1,300, or oh, I'm sorry, about 960 white people. Um, so that that's the, the data that I have, but I'd be interested to hear um, where Peter's um, data is from and, and to take a look at that. Um, do, do I have any advice or thoughts on best practices about conducting research and curating exhibits focused on marginalized communities? I'm so pleased that you asked that question. And I do want to um, also speak to the many others who had a role to play in the exhibition. The dissertation research I've been talking about is my own, but I was one of three curators uh, of the exhibition. So I want to acknowledge my friends and partners, R.L. Watson and Shadi Ayurinde, who each brought um, really wonderful perspectives to the show. And I think as I was selecting partners for the show, um, I would say this is a best practice that I will certainly be following in the future. I wanted really to think about how I could put together a team that would bring uh, a range of perspectives. So rather than finding someone else who was an expert in 18th century art history, I hired Sade, who is actually an expert on um, uh, representations of Black men in the 1990s. Um, and so she brought to bear a really interesting, different perspective um, that allowed, I, I think she really spearheaded contacting contemporary artists um, for responses to certain pictures in the show that we uh, incorporated into our interpretation. Um, she also being kind of more closely connected than I am to histories of racist visual culture in the 19th century um, was responsible for um, bringing in that theme in the exhibition where we do have a section that looks at those developing visual vocabularies of racism in the 19th century, which I had not thought we would really go that far uh, in, forward in time. Um, and uh, so R.L. Watson, who is really a cultural studies scholar, um, whose expertise ranges so widely, but it's incredible. They're really a Renaissance uh, scholar from, from 
uh, Cotton Mather and his approach to uh, talking about blackness in 17th century New England to, you know, into the present day. And so RL looks much more broadly at histories of blackness and responses to blackness and black creativity. So um, I think the three of us together, um, um, I think really brought out the best in one another. And um, we also, I think, uh, became, uh, well, RL is already a close friend of, of a long time, but we all became friends. And I said, I think that trust and being able to establish that trust is really, really important in working on these kinds of projects so that everyone can feel safe and um, and welcome and open to expressing their feelings. Um, we were really able to rely on one another that we were um, speaking freely. We also um, brought in a, a large um, range of other scholars to work with us on the book project. And that was a multidisciplinary um, project as well. So I think having multiple voices is a really um, important, but also just exciting and joyful um, part of the process. So that that would be just one thing that I would that would that comes to mind. I see so many questions. So I'm going to keep looking down. Um, Yes, so the boy's face is so much more interesting and detailed than the four potters who look very bland and generic. So we're talking about the potter overmantling, and I'll just go back to that because we have um, a couple of questions about this. Um, yes, and I think we see this in other examples, actually, of depictions of... Um, of black figures in white portraits. And it's almost sometimes I think, you know, the white artist goes on autopilot depicting the white figures. Um, and because perhaps they're not as used to depicting black figures, they're actually looking. Um, we see an example of this. I'm, I don't, I think I only have one example of a work by Hesalius, but all of his white people look exactly like this. They all have these almond shaped eyes. Um, but he, we had two pictures by him in the exhibition in New York, and the white figures both looked very similar. The black figures looked much more individual. So I think um, sometimes these white artists were shooting themselves in the foot, and and uh, uh, you know even even with different degrees of um, of training. Um, let's see, have I employed in my research genealogy or other exploration of descendant communities to help try to fill in the historical record? Absolutely. Um, and one example of that was um, the interviews that I conducted with Bonnie Johnson and Joan Huggins Banbury um, in connection to the Ralph Earl picture that we were just talking about. Joan in particular has done extensive genealogical research on her family. Um, and she was um, hugely generous and helpful to us um, with respect to researching the Phillips family. We also, um, I haven't been able to talk about this yet, but um, uh, there's a, another work in the show where we were able to connect with the uh, Lloyd family who descend from uh, the, the Vassal family of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and they were... Uh, went out of their way to um, to help us connect uh, connect the dots. Um, the Lloyd family has also organized their own um, organization uh, committed to um, raising awareness about uh, early Black histories and histories of slavery in um, the Boston metro area, uh, which many of you may be aware of. I think I'm sure Sarah can share some links. Um, some of you may be interested in in the different. Um, programs that the slave history uh, the slave history legacy coalition is organizing including a trip to historic deerfield to see unnamed figures in the month of june um so um rebecca is asking are there no extant respectful representations of free black people absolutely there are um but we don't really start to see this happen in the same uh it, it, with um the level of um that level of respect until the 19th century. And so this is the other half of my presentation that I didn't get to, but we do start to see Black subjects emerging from the margins in the 19th century with examples like um, these extraordinary portraits of William and Nancy Lawson, who were Bostonians um, 
William Lawson was a um, was a uh, clothing dealer in Boston. And uh, but I do like to point out in talking about these pictures again, how rare they are. Um, it's not until photography emerges that we really do have a wealth of black representation that's directed by um, black subjects themselves, by black people, even with portraiture. And I think part of this, you know, it's usually chalked up to a sort of a lack of financial access for many black New Englanders, but I actually think, even the form of oil portraiture had kind of a coded whiteness to it. I mean, when we look back at how Black people were represented in the 18th century, we can understand why, you know, you have a little bit of money, but maybe you don't want to go sit for a white portraitist as a member of a burgeoning Black middle class. Maybe you would prefer to have your photograph taken. Um, and I think, you know, with examples like this, there was a convergence of circumstances uh, that came together to make these portraits possible. One of which was that the Lawsons knew the artist, a white artist, William Matthew Pryor through religious connections and therefore may have felt more comfortable with him. Um, Frederick Douglass famously says, there can be no you know, unbiased portrait of a black person at the hands of a white artist. And he champions photography. Um, as an opportunity for, for Black Americans, which I think is one of the reasons we see uh, so few oil portraits, but so many um, photographic portraits. So yes, there, there are extant respectful representations, but there are later. Um, there sadly are um, very few uh, independent representations of Black Americans and of Black New Englanders in the 18th century. More objects, please, someone says. Okay, I guess I'm not gonna be able to answer all these questions. Oh, the Connecticut minister whom I mentioned at the beginning of the talk is Leonard Bacon. Okay, so and then someone has an interesting question. What are some of the challenges we encountered in trying to bring these works to Deerfield and other venues? It is, is it a blanket question of cost or is there reticence about the themat thematics of race within the exhibition? That's a great question. Um, there was a lot of eagerness um, to embrace the thematics of the exhibition. Um, I think that um, that wasn't a barrier, um, broadly speaking. I think there is um, generally a real, you know, concern and desire across museum professionals to make sure that this material is is um, is, is treated very sensitively and um, sometimes. Uh, there that can usually you sign on to take an exhibition before you can actually see it. And so I think, you know, I could un I can understand why there could have been some, uh, you know, for for anyone um, thinking about taking any any exhibition treating these topics, why you really want to have the full picture of how this is all going to be organized and play out. So we were fortunate to have a close, you know, relationship with folks at Deerfield and um, to be, you know, um, to be able to bring the show to New England in particular, because it's of such particular relevance for the material. Um, Oh, yes, there's a famous, someone says, oh, Peter says, there's a famous Newport, Rhode Island black sailor painting, which turned out to be originally white and later painted as black. Thank mm -hmm. you, Peter. That is a great example, which actually we weren't, we included a picture of that in the catalog. The foreword for our, for the publication is written by the eminent uh, art historian Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw, who speaks about these fakes, this fabrication of Black history. And I don't think I have a picture of it. I'm very sorry to say, but we did include in the exhibition um, an example of a portrait of a Black man that is not what it appears to be. It began its life as a portrait of a white man and was later painted over. And so Gwendolyn speaks very powerfully of um, her experience working with that particular picture and realizing it wasn't what it appeared to be. And I think um, provides a very important case study for why we need to speak openly about the kinds of art historical discoveries that uh, might in the past have just been kind of swept under the rug because no one wants to talk about, um, you know, uh, something like that. Um, 
Let's see. Oh, yes. Are there any images or pieces that we know were done by Black artists? That was the other part of my presentation that I didn't get to do. So, okay, there's this is a great one to talk about, and we'll see how many more questions I can answer after that. But um, there is a section, uh, a really exciting section of the show on early Black makers. Um, typically, Black craftsmen were um, more likely to be engaged with uh, you know, what I might call material culture, sort of objects of everyday life. And for reasons I think we can understand, we're not often kind of invited into the realm of fine art. But this is a very unusual example that we see a recently, um, uh, recently kind of brought to greater awareness with the work of the portraitist Prince Dima, who was a Bostonian. He was enslaved in, in Boston and Marlboro, Massachusetts by the two people represented here, Christian and Henry Barnes. And we know as much as we do about Dima actually because of a third picture that is signed by him, which is now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this is a great example of how sometimes you get, um, you don't get what you think you want as a, you know a curator trying to build a show, but then it turns out to be better anyway. So I wanted to borrow the signed work. It wasn't available because the Met is, has been reinstalling their collections. And then I realized that there are these two other pictures and they were in the Hingham Historical Society. Um, they had not been able to uh, confirm their attribution to Dima without that signed picture. It was that signed picture that became the Rosetta Stone and the technological similarities between the pictures allowed the group to be all attributed to Dima. Um, but these pictures are even more interesting to me in some ways. And it's because of what I'm sure you can all see. Both of these pictures have damage to them. This is not just wear. This is the result, we believe, of an iconoclastic attack that took place in the 18th century. These two were loyalists. And so rather than attacking the body of the loyalists, the patriots saw the power in these portraits, right? These are not just images. These are powerful objects. The patriots... Um, we believe took out their their anger on these two portraits. And it looks like Christian Barnes, the woman was stabbed with a bayonet and that Henry Barnes may have been shot with um, a bullet. And what is really fascinating about this, so this damage has been preserved in the interest of telling that story. And what we learn about Dima, you know, what we can uh, envision um, is that this violence symbolizes this moment of rupture that changed so much in society in Massachusetts and elsewhere at the time. So it was this moment of violence that is manifested here that allowed Dima and others like him to self-emancipate. So his enslavers abscond um, and Dima is, um, is able to self-emancipate. Fascinatingly, he's kind of a the story that's similar to Phyllis Wheatley, the Boston enslaved poet who I'm sure you all know, he was essentially sponsored by the Barneses to, um, in his training and sent to London to learn from a painter there after John Singleton Copley refused to tutor him. Not sure why it could have been racially motivated or it could have just been Copley being Copley. Um, so he comes back and then he depicts the Barneses um, and not long thereafter, um, the Barneses flee and Dima is um, himself actually joins the revolutionary cause, which was not infrequent because, as you might imagine, you know, emancipation takes place, but there are no social structures in place for enslaved people to um, uh, to find gainful employment. So it, it makes sense that he then joins the revolutionary cause. Um, Okay, so, oh, we have until 7.30. Oh, good. Okay, I'm sorry. For some reason, I thought I was really <laughs> pushing my my time. So, um, think, Emily, you can go back and, and finish the rest of your presentation. Okay, you okay great. I, I will talk about a couple other things. I gave you a bit of an introduction to the development of portraiture in the 19th century. Um, I would say as often as we have examples like this, uh, of uh, a Black couple who are really, I think, reveling in their ability to, um, to create these likenesses and to make choices about uh, their, their own presentation. I mean, just 
uh, the complexity and the beauty of all of her accessories. She has numerous pieces of jewelry on, the ribbon, the lace, the voluminous fabric, the fact that she's holding a book as an indicator of literacy, which was a common attribute in paintings of this time for a Black woman, particularly powerful. And then he looks like he's simpler, but in fact, I I mean, his style is just oozing off the off the canvas to me. And the fact that he is holding a, not just a cigar, but a lit cigar, which is very unusual. I can't think of another 19th century portrait with an example of this. So they clearly decided to spend more money on her portrait. We know William Matthew Pryor was someone who offered services at different price points. So he, we have advertisements where he's saying, you can have a plain picture, you can have an example, uh, uh, which, you know, would have been maybe $5, or you can have something like Nancy Lawson's portrait, which would have been the top of the line, probably a $25 portrait. But as often as we have pictures like this, we have pictures like this one, which also visually seems to be a very um, a respectful portrait, a lively depiction of personality. This is a man named Abraham Hansen, who was a barber in Bangor, Maine. Um, barbering was um, a prominent profession in the African-American community at this time. Um, so he is someone who could likely have afforded to purchase a portrait for himself, but this picture was not made for him. It was made for the white artist to hang in his studio, to speak to the artist's virtuosity at, at as, as his um, his niece's memoir of him describes it as one of his sort of uh, problem-solving pictures. He also depicted an indigenous woman um, known as Sarah Molasses. And um, so examples like this, um, I think, show how even, even with strides being made at this time, this is not a kind of march towards redemption. Unfortunately, we still have uh, representation very much being dictated by a white agenda in the realm of uh, of portraiture. So, and then as I mentioned, we also do very much have the entry onto the scene, the, this evolving racist satire. Um, we're seeing an example of this in um, one of a series of broadsides produced in Boston in the early 19th century. As you can see, not only are these figures um, given exaggerated features, uh, stereotypically so, but also there's a mockery of Black vernacular English. Um, but nonetheless, this is testimony to an incredibly important and powerful event that took place annually when members of the African society would meet to celebrate um, abolition, the abolition of the slave trade. And so I think as much as we see this document as a document of racism, it's, a, it's an incredible testament to these men's bravery because they were taking their lives into their hands to parade in this way through the streets of Boston, being subjected not just to verbal abuse, but even to violence. Um, I had planned to end on this example of a representation, which is complicated um, and connects to... Um, I think all of the 19th century representations we've been talking about so far, because it obviously is responding to a racist visual culture. We have exaggerated features, um, but we know from the history of this object, which actually descended with a note uh, from the family of the maker, who was a white girl living in Cambridge. We know that she intended this as a kind of memorial tribute to a man named Darby Vassell, who I referenced in one of my question, um, one of my answers a few minutes ago. So Darby Vassell uh, was enslaved in what's now known as the Longfellow House or Washington's headquarters on Brattle Street in Cambridge. Um, his family, his parents, Tony Vassell and Cuba Vassell had um, come to, to Massachusetts uh, with in Cuba's case, the royal family, um, whose house you can visit uh, in Medford, the royal house and slave quarters. Um, Darby Vassell was born in the Longfellow house and enslaved there um, until um, his boyhood. He was um, also you know, present during that time period, that time of rupture of the revolution when 
um, the enslavers of the Vassal family all fled, and uh, there was an opportunity to self-emancipate. Just an extraordinary history and really an underrepresented um, history of the Vassal family who are um, pioneers, um, Toby and Cuba Vassal, um, successfully petition uh, the Massachusetts government for um, for a pension. Uh, they first try to um, secure land uh, for themselves on the estate that they were enslaved on. They're denied in this first petition, but then they are granted a pension. Um, they go on to become founders of the Black community in Cambridge known as Louisville, which is short-lived because uh, uh, later generations um, make the decision to emigrate to um, to Liberia, um, but very important steps taken by them. Uh, and Darby become, Darby Vassal becomes an important member of the free Black community. He joins the African Society. Um, he's one of the founding members. He may well have been, we don't have documentation of this, but he could, um, I think, very likely have been someone who was marching in the streets um, in these parades. Um, and he also is a petitioner, a petitioner for Black education, and becomes a very well-known, well-respected member of the community. So I think uh, I would love to share with you, um, this is an example, again, of, a, of an opportunity that we had to work with descendants, and we were so grateful to Dennis Lloyd and his daughters, um, Egypt and Jordan Lloyd, for sharing their responses to the doll. Um, because I think especially with an object like this, which is so complex, we're seeing um, a stereotypical representation in some cases, but also understanding that this was intended as a tribute and we do see the care put into the making of the clothes. It kind of encapsulates these tensions of um, racism, but at the time, at least a progressive, um, desire to support abolition, but it's conflicted, right? They're still um, well-intentioned, they're well-intentioned people who just aren't getting it. Um, and I think that's what this doll symbolizes in many ways, but we were really excited to be able to speak with the Lloyd family and to have their response to the doll and to be able to share that with our visitors. Um, Dennis Lloyd um, remarks, and I'll just read you this quotation um, because I think it's, it's very powerful. Of all the many African-American families that were brought to America, we're very fortunate to be able to know where our family, when our family was brought here, where they came from, who brought them here, where they resided, where they worked, and in the case of Darby Vassal, where he died and where he's buried. So he's buried at Christ Church, Cambridge, um, outside of Harvard Square. And Jordan Lloyd speaking in particular to um, some of the challenges of the representation, she says, the fact that this doll has been preserved is very important. It speaks to the preciousness of that man's life and his impact in his community. We should look at it whether we like it or not now. Um, so that I love that phrase from Jordan, and it's really become something of a leitmotif for me in looking at this um, virulently racist later material to look whether we like it or not. Um, we have to look if we're really going to understand the different dimensions um, and um, to really under, uh, try to understand um, these historical experiences. So um, I'll, I'll close with some images of um, Darby Vassal's signature and of some places that are important to his life and to the life of his Descendants, we have here a map of Cambridge Common, which is where um, the uh, where Christchurch, Cambridge, is located. Um, we have the African um, Meeting House in Beacon Hill, which was, as I'm sure many of you know, a black neighborhood for a long time. Um, and we have a depiction of uh, Herbert Wolf, who was uh, a descendant of the family who operated his florist shop in Charlestown in the um, in the 19th century. Um, and I'll close and take more questions with this final thought. This is, um, oh, I should have chosen a, a picture from New England. This is from Wilmington, Delaware, but we wanted to include examples of uh, black uh, portrait photographs from the 19th century to exemplify how, um, how important it becomes when there is um, a fresh technology um, that's unburdened by these um, 
really heavy art historical legacies. Um, and uh, Black uh, Americans really respond by um, seeking out their representations. Um, very powerful collection of images on loan to us from an archive in New York City. So we have this wonderful quotation from Frederick Douglass, even the humbled servant girl may now possess a more perfect likeness. Um, so I will stop there and see if we have any last questions. Let's see. Do we know where Prince Dima is buried? No, uh, I don't believe that we do. I can recommend um, for further reading on Dima, there's a wonderful article written by Paula Bagger of the Hingham Historical Society and Amelia Peck of the Met. They wrote an article for the magazine Antiques, um, I think about 10 years ago. And then my own dissertation supervisor, Jennifer Van Horn, um, recently published a book on uh, Black representations called Portraits of Resistance, which has a wonderful chapter on Dima. So you can read um, much more about him and what we know about him. We do know that he died during the course of the Revolutionary War. Um, and he left a will, actually, which is remarkable. Um, he, um, he leaves his worldly goods to his mother, Daphne, who survives. Um, and it may well be, I, I'm not sure I have this right, but it may well be that um, uh, that she um, was the reason that we have uh, the memories that we do of, of Dima and the preservation of the pictures. Any other questions? Let's see. Do you see anything else that I didn't get to, Sarah? Uh, I had a question about the and so if you have an approximate idea of the number of portraits around the same time, what percentage include black people? Because it must be minuscule. As you well, say, so you mean elsewhere in the Atlantic? Division. You mean beyond New England? Uh, no, in New England, if you have that. Well, New in, in New England, in colonial New England, there are only the two that I showed right. um, that we know about. Um, right. Watercolor opens up some opportunities for new representations. Um, I but if we're talking about just, you know, portraits of Black figures, so not the trope of the Black page, um, I can't give you a percentage. I'm, I'm not sure that anyone has really done that. Um, has see, done it's, such that. A it's such a conscious decision to include them. Mm -hmm. It's such a tiny number that have, or at least those that have survived. Well, I can tell you, William Matthew Pryor was one of the most pro prolific um, artists in terms of representing Black subjects. And he, I mean, he painted, I think, oh boy, maybe I'm going to get this wrong. He painted hundreds of portraits. I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. um, and we know eight of them were of Black subjects. So even for someone who may have had abolitionist sympathies and who, who clearly was you know, committed to painting black sitters, that's a very small number. Um, I don't know if that is helpful. No, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think that's it for questions. People, I mean, you're getting lots of compliments. This was great, thanks so much. Highly engaging. Everybody's, <laughs> I think um, perhaps, Emily, you could send me some of the uh, the references that you mentioned. And I can send that out in a link sure. to get information about the uh, Slave Legacy uh, Historic, Slave Legacy History Coalition organizing mm -hmm. the day long trip, uh, leaving from Cambridge and returning to Cambridge on a bus uh, an entire day in historic Deerfield, including of course, a visit to the exhibition. Um, we re I really want to encourage you to go to the exhibition. It is, as you can tell, it is just superb, really thought provoking, really just opens your eyes in a new way. And also the catalog is well worth having, acquiring and reading. Um, I ordered mine from the American Folk Art Museum in New York, so I didn't have to carry it home. I have to say, I don't know how many more copies we have at this point. It's been our most successful publication in recent memory. So. Superb, it, including the introductory essay by Emily. And so wonderful articles by my colleagues, R.L. Watson and um, Shade Ayurinde, um, as well as many others. So 
Yeah. Anyway, I, I want to tell you, everybody, so I'll be sending out the link to this recording as well as to the other two in this series and um, in the next few days. And I our next uh, events are we're shifting gears and we're going to be talking about the witchcraft trials in Salem with the two curators of the next of the new Salem trial exhibition at the Peabody Essex Museum are going to be speaking to us to you, I should say, on the 18th of June, followed by uh, on July 20th, Neil Wright, who's a board member of the Partnership of Historic Boston and the expert on Boston Lincolnshire is going to talk about Boston, the prequel, that is the Boston that lived existed a long before anyone even imagined Massachusetts or indeed New England. So um, stay with us for those events. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Please make a donation if you can. Um, and let's all, if we virtually clap for Emily, because a really superb and fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, Emily. My pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Yeah, thank you.